Anybody? Okay, there's quite a few arms and hands going up. You know, let's face it. Life can be hard at times, can it? There are many things in this world that can cause us to have troubled hearts. Now, there's a lot of tension throughout the world today. I mean, economically, the world's in a very, very difficult spot. It seems that news coming from the financial sector does not give much comfort as we hear about global recessions on a continual basis and now China's economy is collapsing and Wall Street's um, going into turmoil. I mean, all kinds of things. Militarily, the news isn't much better. Tensions in the Middle East are at an all-time high with revolts and terrorist attacks and, and chemical weapons being used on civilians in Syria. And speaking about Syria, if you guys have seen some of the news footage, masses of people marching, trying to get somewhere where they could be safe. I mean, the humanitarian refugee crisis. I mean, basically, the Hungarian government is just escorting people through their country right now. Don't stay here. Just come in the one area. We'll get you out the other quickly. Horrible, difficult things. I mean, even here in the United States, things don't seem to be anything but trouble. And just one evening of watching political updates on the news is enough to give a person an ulcer. And the list could go on and on and on. On top of various national and international troubles, there are all kinds of what-if scenarios. What if I get cancer? What, what if I'm in an accident? What if my spouse leaves me? What if one of my children dies? What if I lose my job? What if I'm rejected at school? School's just starting up. I'm sure there's a lot of what-if things going on through our, our students' minds. For some of them, your concerns may not be national or international concerns or even based on what-if scenario, but based on the reality of your current situation. You may be a single parent wondering how to provide and be a good parent to your children. You may be barely making ends meet and feeling overwhelmed with your financial obligations. You may be dealing with chronic health problems and you're, you're weighing the myriad of medical options for treatment. And again, the list could go on and on and on. Today, if your heart is troubled and you're feeling confused, concerned, overwhelmed, you're in good company. Jesus' disciples felt the same way. In our passage this morning, as we continue on through our look at the Upper Room Discourse, Jesus addresses his disciples' concerns and their worries and he gives them immense spiritual comforts. And the same is available to all of us this morning as well. I invite you to turn with me, if you haven't already, to John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, picking up right where we left off last week as we're working our way through the Upper Room Discourse. And let me just read this passage to you beginning in John chapter 14, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Father in heaven, we come before you right now and we just acknowledge that life can be hard. Our hearts can get troubled. But Lord, may we find comfort in the scriptures today. May we find comfort in you as the way and the truth and the life. Open our hearts and our minds, Holy Spirit, to what you'd have us learn today, that we may be more like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Now, as you read through the flow of John's entire gospel, if you remember, we've been looking at the Upper Room Discourse starting in chapter 13, but if you look through the entire flow of the entire gospel of John from the beginning to where we're at, you will see that that things are really starting to come to a head through all that's been going on. If you remember in chapter 13, which we've looked at over the past couple of weeks, Jesus demonstrated the full extent of his love through the washing of his disciples' feet. And then he lets them know that he will be leaving them and that they cannot follow at that time, but they will at a later date. And then he gives them a new command to love each other just as he loved them. That's what we looked at last week, if you remember. All of this is leading up to the cross. Now, it is understandable that the disciples would be very confused and troubled over this news. They had a whole different thing in mind of how they're going to overthrow Rome and and bring about God's kingdom. And this is like mind-boggling and very concerning and very troubling. They have followed Jesus for the last three years or so, ministering with him, learning from him, laughing together, having meals together. I mean, just experiencing and enjoying life. This is their great friend. They've developed a deep love for Jesus. And now he's telling them that he's leaving. And they cannot follow at this time. And it's in this spot that Jesus, knowing how the disciples are feeling, I'm sure you can just read their faces, he gives them two commands. Listen again to verse 1 of chapter 14. There are two commands here. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Jesus tells the disciples to not let their hearts be troubled and that they must trust in God and in him. Those are the two commands. Hey, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and me. Both of these statements are written in the present imperative voice. Isn't that exciting? But in other words, these are two commands that are to be followed right now. Now, right now, guys. In other words, when the disciples heard the news that Jesus was leaving, they became very confused, very anxious, very troubled. And Jesus tells them, hey, stop being troubled and trust in me right now, guys. That's what he's saying. Quit being troubled. Trust in me right now, guys, right now. And as many of you probably know, this is sometimes easier said than done, isn't it? When you're feeling anxious over something, it's it's hard to just stop it, even though that may be the very thing that's needed to be done. I didn't pull it up again, but I I showed it a couple years ago. You guys remember the old Bob Newhart skit? I showed it in here where he's telling that person, just stop it! And if you haven't, I mean, just Google Bob Newhart slash stop it, and you'll, it's pretty funny. But I wonder if that's how the disciples felt. I mean, they were understandably troubled, and Jesus says, stop it. Quit trusting in what you can see and start trusting in me, guys. You know, sometimes Christians can feel that way as well. Life is hard. And again, for those that have walked for a few years, it doesn't take long to figure it out. Maybe like five, six years, or even less. You realize that life is hard. And there are things that can understandably concern us, cause us difficulty, give us troubled hearts. It is really tough when the bank is threatening repossession on your home and you don't have a job. That is hard. It can be scary and provoke anxiety when your marriage is falling apart no matter how you pray and how hard you try to make things better. It can be crushing when the lab results come back and they say, malignant. I understand. You become troubled in your hearts. And and well-meaning Christians come along and say, stop it. You just need to trust in God. And you begin to think, how in the world can I just stop it? I'm scared. I want you to know today 
that Jesus was not just being callous to the disciples' feelings. He knew how they felt. He's going to the cross. He understands concern and troubled hearts. But he also knew that their fears were unfounded because they simply could not see the bigger picture. There is great comfort in our verses today. You do not have to be troubled in heart or worried or anxious when going through difficult times. Why? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. When, not if, you have a troubled heart, it is simple belief in Jesus and his promises that will sustain you. When things get difficult, life is hard, your heart is troubled, circumstances around you are swirling, and you're scared, and rightfully so. It is simple belief in Jesus and his promises that will sustain you and bring you through this. Why? Well, we are controlled by what we gaze at. I want you to think about that. We are controlled by what we gaze at. When all we can see is the enormity of our problems, and that's all we're staring at, it is really hard to see anything else. You know, if you hold a quarter up in front of your face and gaze intently at it, you can block out the sun. That's pretty amazing to think about. You can take a little quarter... And you can block out the entire sun if you wanted to by gazing at that quarter alone. Jesus knows that his followers will be controlled by what they gaze at. So he turns their attention to the glories of heaven. You see what Jesus does? We are controlled by what we gaze at. Jesus knows that his disciples will be controlled by what they gaze at. So he actually shifts their focus then. He turns their attention to the glories of heaven. There's difficult times going, guys. They're coming. It's going to get rough. Yes, I'm leaving and things are going to get hard. But don't focus on that. Look heavenward. Listen to verse 2 again. Well, In verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going there to prepare a place for you. Now, understand that while I am not trying to minimize anybody's difficulties in here today, there are some difficult circumstances represented right here in our congregation this morning, and I am not minimizing it. They are tough things. I want to remind you, they're temporary. Whatever you're going through today is temporary. The reality of our heavenly home can be, provide a salve to your spirits and guard against becoming troubled in hearts. No matter how badly things may be going in your life today, Jesus promised you a glorious eternity. Do you feel frequently dwell on Jesus' eternal dwelling place prepared for you? You should. What a great thing to think on. Think about it this way. When we plan to go on, on a vacation, on a family vacation, do you just hop in the car and drive off with no prior preparation? No. No, we don't do that. Well, if you do, you're silly. But <laughs> no, we don't do that. We go online, we, we look at things to do, we obtain brochures, we consult a map, we budget for, and we, we, we save for expected expenditures. In other words, we prepare diligently to take a trip, right? How much more should we prepare for eternity? Where we'll be spending a lot more time than we will here on this earth. When things are difficult, you have a choice. You can gaze at your problem and become anxious, or you can gaze at your heavenly reward and find comforts. You know, most evenings, not every evening, 
Um, I wish I could stand up here and say every evening, but most evenings I take a prayer walk. We get the kids to bed, and uh, Julie and I spend a little bit of time talking on the couch, and then I go out for a prayer walk. And one of the things that I like to do is just look at the stars as I'm walking. It's usually dark by that time, and, and just be overwhelmed by God, and just praise Him and thank Him for just His creation. And, and then I think about how wonderful it is, and then I think about heaven, and how all of this is going to pale in comparison to what God has in store for us. You know, and I might be feeling a little anxious about something, but I can guarantee you just a minute or two of that, and I'm not even thinking about my issue anymore. Oh, it doesn't go away, and I still have to pray about it, and I still have to do things, but boy, do I have a lightness in my step when I'm out just walking, just me and the Lord. Now, I understand that when we face troubling times, we often feel overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed by fear and doubt and grief and conflict, our outer resources may disappear. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough ingenuity. We don't have enough strength. And, and, our, and our inner strength that we may have seems so inadequate. And even though we may be faced with possible or certain failure, the bank's still going to repossess the home. We have assurances in Jesus' words to remain calm and hopeful. Jesus is trustworthy. He has said that he's going to God's house in heaven. Why? To prepare a place for those who call on his name. And he will come back. And he will take them there. I, it doesn't get any better than I get goosebumps just saying those words. Jesus has gone to heaven. And he's preparing a place for you if you call him Savior. And he will come back for you. And he will take you there. Wow. So what exactly is this place that Jesus is preparing? What will it be like? What can we expect? I don't know about you, but I let my mind wander at times. And think about the glories of heaven. But let's see what God's Word has to say right here in just our passage. I, I'm, I could go to many, many passages, but we're just going to look at this passage. And what does God's Word say? Well, the passage simply says, In my Father's house are many rooms, and that Jesus is going to prepare a place for His believers. And the Greek word that's used for rooms in this passage is actually monai, which simply means dwelling place. Now, I'm just curious, does anyone's translation have dwelling place here this morning instead of house? Nobody? You'll see, okay, there is one. Okay, a couple. You'll see sometimes dwelling place as the translation instead of house. And that is the literal translation of that word. I, I know that some people like to think about mansions and heaven and spacious rooms and, and that we're going to be living, you know, in a house that the master carpenter has built you know, um, in fact, Audio Adrenaline, they, they wrote a song in which they sing about God's big house and there's lots and lots of rooms and a, and a big yard to play football. And, and they maybe have heard the song before. Amen. Now, while that's really cool to picture, it may or may not be completely accurate. The reality is, I do not know if these rooms are literal or if they're metaphorical. And neither does anybody else, no matter what they may tell you. There is nothing in the text to tip you either way. Is Jesus speaking literally, these are rooms, or metaphorically, this dwelling place? However, with that said, in either case, here's what I can tell you. We will be with God. We will be with God the creator of the universe. If you take them as literal, if you think that Jesus is speaking literally, then, well, we're going to be living in some kind of specially designed rooms for all eternity. Maybe we'll be playing football and eating food. I, I don't know. And my guess is if that's the case, they will be far greater than anything here on this earth. 
The Taj Mahal will pale in comparison to God's house. And maybe Audio Adrenaline's take on the matter is spot on. You know, maybe we'll be out there playing football in silver and black uniforms. Is that right? Amen. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> It could be that we're living in these great rooms. I mean, better than anything you've ever seen. He's out of here. (laughs) If it is metaphorical, okay, if it's not literal, then the destination becomes not so much a physical place, this this mansion, this house that we're going to live in, but rather a person. In this way, then, we dwell in Jesus, both now and for all eternity. And and there is comfort and peace as well as safety and security in that as well. Either way, and and it doesn't matter. I mean, if you take it literal, great. If if you take it metaphorical, that's fine too. There's not, that's either, either one's not unbiblical. Either way you take that, we can find peace and comfort when our hearts are troubled because we know that something better awaits for all who believe. You know, I I like to think back and listen to some of the old spirituals from from the slaves back in the 1800s and something. What is the common theme in almost all of them? Heaven. They had no inclination that their life was going to get better on earth, but then there was heaven. Oh, Who's ready to go? I'm ready to go. <laughs> Let's just pack up and go. Right now. You know, I think the disciples were ready to go. But they had a problem. You see, they did not know how to get there. In fact, they did not even know where Jesus was going. And so Thomas, he states the obvious. Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how are we going to get there? Good question. And I would like to talk about that for a few moments this morning. Because I find Jesus' answer to Thomas' question fascinating. Jesus says, I'm you know, in God's house. There's many rooms. I'm going. I'm preparing. You're going to go there. Thomas said, hey, we don't know where you're going, Jesus. What are you talking about? How are we going to get there? And Jesus tells Thomas how to get there. But what he says is he lets him know that He is the way. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You want to know how to get there? You're looking at the way to get there. It's me. Now, we've talked about this on a number of different occasions over the years that I've been preaching to you guys. And it's reiterated by Jesus in the Upper Room Discourse. And it's simply just this. I have stated this in hundreds of ways, in in, in different ways, the same simple truth. Jesus is the only way to gain access to the Father, to receive salvation, and to live in relationship with God. That's it. It's Jesus and Jesus only. He is the only way to gain access to the Father, to receive salvation to live in relationship with God. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Not a way, not a truth, and not a life. There is no other way for a person to be saved from their sins and receive salvation than through Jesus Christ. That's it. There is no way to gain access to heaven. The place that Jesus is preparing for those who believe in him. Jesus is the way. Jesus is both God and man. He knows intimately our experiences and our needs. He is our path, our bridge, our transport. Not an example, not a road sign. He is our guide with dependable directions and powerful protection for all who believe. Our personal relationship with Christ links us to God. In fact, he will bring us to the Father himself. Our response should be to follow his guidance, trusting his ability to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Jesus is the truth. 
He is our source of intimate knowledge of the Father. His answers, teaching, and commands, they were and they are right. No shadow of dishonesty, falsehood, or lying was ever in his life, ever. He is the reality of all that God has promised. Our response should be to believe in him and put into practice what he taught. Jesus is the life. Jesus gives us life both now and eternally. His life provides the surest model for our own. His prom he promises to join his life to ours. There is no other source of life besides Jesus. Our response should be to receive that life and allow it to work itself out in our daily experiences. Now, I know that this teaching of Jesus being the only way to God has received a lot of pushback in our tolerant and diversified society today. In fact, anyone who holds unwaveringly to this truth that Jesus is the way and the only way will be branded all kinds of derogatory terms. But I want you to understand fully that even though that is the case today, it does not make the teaching untrue. Even though that's society's response it does not make the teaching untrue. In fact, it is a non-negotiable fact for God's children. If someone comes tickling people's ears with another way or Jesus being a way, flee. It is not biblical truth. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father, but through Him. It is Jesus and Jesus only. We have to understand that. It is Jesus and Jesus only. And I understand that many people are shocked nowadays that Christians insist upon Jesus being the way and the only way. But you know what? Christians did not invent this claim. Jesus himself made the claim. Therefore, it really isn't a question of tolerance or being open to diversity. It is a question of whether or not we want to accept what Jesus said. There's no confusion about what he said. So it's not a question of being a tolerant person or an open-minded person. It's a question of whether or not you're going to accept Jesus and what he said. I am convinced that while people feign some superior openness than Christians when it comes to rejecting Jesus' claims, well, I'm just more open-minded and tolerant and diversified, and, and they put on this superiority, it really just is a matter of sin. You know, the following, I believe, are three reasons why people may reject the exclusivity of Jesus. And I'm not going to get bogged down in this, but just to let you guys know, because you're going to see this and face this and get in these conversations as you go through life. You know, someone is maybe going through a hard time and you want to encourage them by pointing them to Jesus and, and, and what his words are and how he can give them hope and peace. And they're like, oh, I just can't believe you believe that. You know, how close-minded are you? And and it can get so difficult and discouraging sometimes. But, but I think the people are in one of three areas, really. I think some people are satisfied with their own way or, or with doing nothing. You know, they, they refuse on principle to even examine Christ's claims. These people are often happy in their sinful lives, really. And often, if you press them, they will admit that they're not truly happy, but they see no compelling reason to change. Also, I believe they're often intellectually flabby and lazy. They don't take time to really dig in and see what Jesus said. They're not willing to, to take that time and think deeply about spiritual things and truly examine the words of Christ. They just dismiss them outright. They feign some kind of superiority, but I think in reality they're sinful and lazy. Other people simply deny their lostness. These people, they have a very high view of mankind, of humanity. They believe that all people are inherently good and that it is systems and life that corrupts people. Often you'll, you'll see these people, they'll spend immense amount of time 
trying to change the society through government or other institutions. Now, I'm not going to try to sway people one way or another with the upcoming election in a little over a year. I'm so excited to be listening to this. <laughs> Listen closely to Bernie Sanders' speeches, and you will hear this coming out in all kinds of interesting ways. If we put the right governmental institutions in place, we will cure what ails humanity in our society. I don't think so. I don't think so. I will admit that people in this camp often have good motives, good people. They sometimes do good things through social programs and stuff. But you see, they have a flawed starting premise. They're wrong right out of the gate. They refuse to acknowledge the universal control that sin has over people. They simply do not believe they need a savior. They just need to fix society. And then all will be well. Lastly, there are still others who are convinced that there must be several valid ways besides Jesus to get to God. God's up on this mountain, and there's lots of paths up the mountain. They agree that there is a problem of sin, and that mankind is in need of redemption. They will say, yeah, I agree with you there. But they are convinced that any way is as good as another, even if they have not chosen a way for themselves. But as we've already stated, Jesus claimed to be the only way to God the Father. This isn't something people made up. Jesus makes this claim. Now, some people may argue, well, that way is too narrow. Who are you to say that? Well, in reality, it's wide enough for the whole world if the world chooses to accept it. You know, instead of worrying about how limited it sounds to have only one way, we should be saying, thank you, God, for providing a sure way to get to you. That should be our response. Jesus' claim is really unmistakable. People may want to argue, well, it's not what he really said, and there's all these different kinds of things. It's just denial and pushing things aside. His claim is unmistakable, and it really forces an unconditional response. Jesus invites people to accept or reject him, making it clear that partial rejection or partial acceptance is rejection. His self-description invalidates alternative plans of salvation. As mentioned, some would say that a single way is just way too restrictive. But that attitude fails to see the desperate state of the human condition. We all need a Savior. That there is a way at all is evidence of God's grace and love. You know, we started this message by asking if any one of us here has ever experienced a troubled heart. The truth is, all of us at one point or another have, and we probably will again at some point in time, but we do not have to be troubled in hearts. We must trust in God and in Jesus. Let the fact that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and he's in heaven preparing a place for all who would believe to be a spiritual salve to your weary soul. Is anyone weary in here today? Okay, there's a few hands going up. And I probably would submit there should be some more. If you are weary today, then look to heaven. Look to Jesus. Understand that, that when you are in Jesus, you have spiritual power to live life now. And you have the wonders of heaven awaiting you for all eternity. And in case you didn't realize, eternity is a really, really long time. If I were to take a string around the entire globe and take a Sharpie and put one little point on that to represent 75 years or so, that still isn't adequate 
to how long that's going to be in comparison to eternity. Think about that. You will be with Jesus for eternity. We're going to close our service with a song called Cornerstone, and, and the, the worship team can start making their way up. And I've been thinking about this song all week as I was writing this sermon, and then we, we rehearsed it on Thursday, and, and um, I just was overcome with gratitude to God as we sang the third verse of that song. When he shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Wow. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And when we are found in him, we have access to the Father and we are dressed in His righteousness and are faultless before God. Think through your last week. Just think through your last week. I don't know what you were up to in the quietness of your own heart and mind. 